If you have any complaint, don't hesitate to return it. We'll exchange it without question, provided you have the receipt, you haven't worn it, and it's not creased. <laughs> Captain Peacock. Yes, Mr. Harmon. Well, you told me not to come on the floor when the store was open without attracting your attention first. That is quite correct, Mr. Harmon. <laughs> Oh, I see I've attracted your attention. Go back. You've not had my permission. Does that mean you don't want the first prize in Grace Bubba's lucky lottery what your department has won? What was that? I'm proud to tell you and pleased that you are now the proud possessor of a box at Convent Garden for six personages for the valet. There is the ticket. <gasps> oh, how wonderful! Well, last time I had a box at Covent Garden, it was on me head and full of cauliflower. <laughs> well, uh, there are the tickets for your counter, Mr. Klein. And there are yours, Miss Brahms. Thank you. Oh, Miss Brahms, uh, where's Mrs. Slocum? Oh, she's in the fitting room taking off her coat. We've been open for nearly six minutes, Miss Brahms. Go and get her. Yes, sir. You're not drinking at this hour. <laughs> of course I'm not, Miss Brahms. I'm just taking Miss Slimming Pill. Only I've run out of water. And I can't bear neat gin. Why don't you uh, take the pill with the plain tonic? Oh, I can't stand the taste of tonic. <laughs> That's why I'm putting gin and lemon in. <laughs> Captain Peacock wants to see you. Customer. She brought one of them ribbed cardigans and it shrunk. Oh, not another one. Yeah, and it's your customer and all. Leave it to me, Miss Brahms. I'm just in the mood. <laughs> <laughs> now, madam, and what's the trouble? Well, look at this. I followed the washing instructions to the letter and look what happened. And look at the label. It says quite distinctly, non-shrink. Madam. <laughs> I have here the identical garment. There. You see? Compare the labels. The label hasn't shrunk. <laughs> I assume that the instructions apply to the cardigan. Did you? <laughs> well, hard cheese. <laughs> I'm going to take your name. I'm sorry, madam, we're not allowed to give names. Well, in that case, I... Uh, uh, I shall remember your face. <gasps> a bit hard, wasn't it? Well, I'm fed up with them all. Complain, complain, complain. And she just caught me on a bad morning. Did you spend last night on the booze? Certainly not, Miss <laughs> Brahms. I just thought I'd sleep better if I had a nightcap. I mean, you know I've been having these strange dreams lately. Still about Mr Humphreys? Yes. He's different in my dreams. <laughs> I'm beginning to see him in quite a new light. Have you said anything to him? No, but I do feel sometimes when I look at him that he knows something. 
Oh, yeah, she's looking at you again. I know. I can feel the hair standing up on the back of my neck. <laughs> Do you think she wants something? I hope not. Do you know... <laughs> I can't think what's come over her. I've only got to give her the slightest hint of a smile and she goes all wobbly at the knees. <laughs> Watch this. <laughs> See what I mean? Oh, Miss Browns, he smiled at me. Well, it was only a little one. Well, it's only half past nine. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, last night, me and Mrs Axleby went down to the Green Man for a quiet drink. Well, we hadn't had anything to eat, so we just had a couple of bags of pork scratchings and some bacon-flavoured crisps. And one of the crisps got stuck in my throat. And you know it took three or four gin and tonics to shift it. <laughs> and I think that one of those crisps was bad. Because when I got outside at half past eleven, I felt quite dizzy. <laughs> what time did you go into the pub for your nightcap? About quarter to eight. <laughs> but do you know what I think happened? I think my body temperature dropped. Anyway, I hung on to this lamppost and we sang songs to keep us warm. <laughs> but you were glad when the bus arrived. Well, the first one didn't stop. And I know he saw me because I lifted up my skirt and stuck my leg out. Just <laughs> in a joke, you know. And he put his foot down and he drove straight past us. So you had to get on the next one? No, well, but the one after that stopped. <laughs> oh, and the conductor was cheeky. Do you know, the bus was completely empty, but he made us go upstairs. So when I got off, I took, I took his number. Oh, well, I hope you wrote it down. I didn't need to. It's on his hat. <laughs> Is she still looking at me? No. Now, go on, tell us about the rave up you had last night. Well, it wasn't really a rave up. It finished quite early. So about half a dozen of us went back to this bloke's flat that's got this video recorder, you see. I know it belongs to one of these adult X-rated video libraries. Oh, I've heard about those. Yeah. Well, he gets a discount being a theological student. <laughs> anyway, I wondered what happened. You see, he pressed the button and bang, the screen went blank. Oh, so you went home? No, no, no. The sound was working, so we listened to that. But whatever they were doing must have been outside because I heard a lot of wind and shouting. <laughs> oh, I expect it was an orgy. That's what I thought, yes. Especially when I heard some voice say, Mary Rose has turned over and I can see her bottom. <laughs> and the voice shouted, I want to see every man bent over an oar. <laughs> I was just about to take my mother home when I heard this other voice say, which way do you want us to row, Mr. Baines? And I realised it was the old Eden line. <laughs> Where's Mrs. Slocum now? Oh, uh, she's in the ladies fixing her makeup. She's hardly been at her counter at all this morning. Well, to tell the truth, and I don't like telling tales, but I'm very worried about her. I must say her behaviour has been a little strange lately. Well, she says her nerves are bad. She's been having these disturbing nights. You mean disturbed nights? No, disturbing. <laughs> She's got this man on her mind and she keeps dreaming about him. You know, erotic dreams. Really? <laughs> yes, they, they do fantasise at that age, don't they? Oh, no. <laughs> I've got an aunt what's got the yachts for Richard Baker. And who has Mrs. Slocum got the uh, hots for? You'll never believe it. Who? Mr. Humphreys. Really? <laughs> <laughs> yes, they do fantasize at that age, don't they? <laughs> 
Can she tell you about this? Well, not in so many words, but every so often she drops him a little hint. Look, watch. Look at her, she comes. Oh, you deal with her, Mr. Klein, will you? Oh. Was there something you wanted, Mrs. Slocum? Well, I want to buy a present for a rather special gentleman. Ah, oh, well, <laughs> what do you have in mind? Uh, ties, handkerchiefs, socks? Oh, they're not very romantic, Mr. Klein. How about a nice pair of wife fronts? Shut up! <laughs> Well, I had wondered about a pair of gloves to keep his hands warm. Oh, he has such artistic hands. And uh, what kind of gloves did you have in mind, then? Well, just show me what you've got. The size? Well, about... about Mr Humphrey's size. Oh. <laughs> Mr Humphrey's... Mrs Slocum wants to try your hand for size. <laughs> It's very busy brushing a hat at the moment, Mr. Clark. I'll do that, Mr. Humphreys. Thank you, Mr. Spooner. I shall remember that kindness. Here we are. Chinese rabbit, English mole, Venezuela Scotch terrier, kangaroo, chamois, leather, plastic, string, wool, and, if you'll pardon the expression, pigskin. Um, what sort of personality does the gentleman have? Suede. <laughs> ah, well, here we are. Beautiful suede, inside and out. <laughs> Try them on, Mr. Humphreys. Ah, now that, that is a beautiful glove. Just feel it, Mrs. Slocum. You know, I always say, a glove like that really sets a hand off. I think it set her off. <laughs> we have it in three shades, you know. Uh, what uh, colouring does the gentleman have? Well, fair, wavy hair, startling blue eyes, and a strong, sensitive chin. I wonder why she didn't mention the gap in the teeth. Mr. Spooner, get a broom. Stop room these sweet people. I, uh, I take it then you'll settle for these. Yes, put them on my account. It's 22 pounds. Oh, when you've lost your heart to the man of your dreams, what's 22 pounds? 22 pounds is the price of the gloves, plus VAT, minus staff discount. Would you like me to gift wrap them? No. Just leave them on him. <laughs> you like some sugar in your black coffee, Mr. Humphreys? No, thank you, Mr. Klein. I'll have it neat. I need something to calm my nerves. <laughs> she put it into words, then? No, she put it into a pair of gloves. <laughs> Where has she got to? She's gone to the pub for her. Oh, dear. Do you know, I had no idea any of this was happening. She's had a thing about you for weeks. That's why she's been it in the bottle. Well, why didn't you tell me? Well, I thought it would wear off. She's a fine woman. There's a lot of love going to waste there. Mm. First time I felt sorry for a cat. <laughs> <laughs> I expect it's a new experience for you, Mr. Humphreys. On the contrary, Mr. Spooner. Quite a lot of ladies have thought twice about me. <laughs> Probably it's usually the second thought that puts them on. <laughs> you know, it seems to me that if we're not very careful, we're going to have an alcoholic on our hands. Well, I think the best way of dealing with the situation is to find someone else on whom she can lavish her affection. And that might take our mind off Mr. Humphreys. It's very difficult, you know. When I was a young man, there was this girl with frizzy hair and, and staring eyes and, and fat ankles. And every morning when I, when I got to the station, she was there, staring at me. And then she'd get in the compartment and sit right opposite me, staring. And every night it was the same thing. How did you get rid of her? I didn't. I married her. <laughs> 
now the frizzy hair's gone grey and thin, and the eyes stared out from behind big, thick spectacles. What about the ankles? <gasps> Don't mention the ankles. <laughs> Peacock's got the right idea. What sort of a mug in it conning to take your notes of that old trout? Mr. Spooner, if you continue to speak in that way about a senior member of staff, you'll go and sit at another table. Mrs. Slocum might be an old trout, but she's got a lot of nice sides to her. Like what? Well, well, she's very kind when she hasn't been hitting the bottle. Hmm, she's not as fat as she was. You're quite right, Captain Peacock. There's definitely traces there of when she used to be quite a nice-looking woman. Trouble is, she's lonely. Well, if she's lonely, she, she ought to advertise in one of these contact magazines. Oh, no, she's too much pride for that. Well, we could do it for her. We could send them in, get the replies, and pass them on to her. I'll write it all down. How would you describe her? Old bat seeks comfortable tree to hang in. <laughs> I shan't tell you again, Mrs. Spooner. I think petite lady. Oof! <laughs> Hardly petite. Well, she will be by the time she's finished her slimming pill. <laughs> petite lady with own home seeks kind understanding male companion of the opposite sex. <laughs> That's a waste of words. If it's a male companion, he must be of the opposite sex. In my experience, it's better to be safe than sorry. <laughs> you have to state what her interests are. They always put that. What are her interests? Pubs and that pussy of hers. <laughs> Well, to save any misunderstanding, I'll just put pubs. <laughs> there. <laughs> now then, we'll get the replies, vet them, and pass them on to her. What's happened to me? <laughs> well, I just popped into the pub for a packet of cigarettes and... and on the way back, as I was passing the beauty parlour, they literally dragged me in and insisted that I try this on Apro. And you know, as soon as I got it on, everybody said how it suited me. All you need to do now is take all your clothes off, get on a white horse, and you could ride through the streets of Coventry. <laughs> it's the Bride of Frankenstein. <laughs> all right, I'm going, I'm going. But I'd like to state here and now that I'm being victimised for my opinions, and I shall complain to the Council for Civil Liberties. Since you've spent most of the coffee break taking on civil liberties, I don't fancy your chances. Thank you, Captain Peacock. Mrs. Slocum, you've not bought that wig, have you? Well, no. But the sales girl said that as soon as I put it on, the years seemed to just drift away. Wear it round the other way, they'll be right out of sight. <laughs> I'll pick coffee out by the, the fire exit. Was it since you put that ad in that magazine? Well, let me see what she bought me. She bought me a pair of gloves, silk hanky, a pair of socks, some aftershave, a writing pad, some envelopes, and a pair of shorted pyjamas. <laughs> I'd say about ten days. Shouldn't have we been hearing something by now? Oh, I got some replies last night. I phoned one man. He sounded quite nice. He's coming on his way to work this morning to be introduced. What about the others? 
Well, my mother came back and I couldn't very well sit there on the phone talking to strange men saying, hello, you don't know me, but so I went round to the post office. I've sent telegrams to everybody. They go, I've told them to come in here, ask for me and I'll introduce them. Good morning, Sam. Good morning. Are you being Sam? Ah, uh, uh, Mr. Humphreys. Ah. Uh, he's over there, sir. Uh, Mr. Humphrey is a gentleman for you. <laughs> Good morning, sir. Good morning. What's it to be? Uh, well, who knows, young man? Probably the happiest day of my life. Big yeah. pardon. <laughs> oh, well, I've come about the lady in the, uh, in the advert. Oh, yes. Oh. <laughs> She's behind you on the lady's character. Oh, really? Oh, sorry. <laughs> yeah. Which one? The one on the left or the one on the right? And the one on the left. On the left. Oh, yes. Can you see? <laughs> yes, thank you. Good morning. <laughs> <laughs> you cross him up for a start. Yeah. No. Those tides down to me, Miss Brahms. I'm going to shove them all into this bottom drawer. I could do that for you. No, I'm better doing it. It takes me mind off other things. Blimey, look what's arrived. I should never have described her as petite. <laughs> She's smiling at you again. I'm not looking. Well, you'll have to in a minute. She's coming over. <laughs> I'll tell you another thing. I'm not sitting next to her at the uh, opera house. No. I, otherwise, I'm not going. How are you this morning, Mr. Humphreys? Bright-eyed and bushy-tailed, Mrs. Slocum. <laughs> <laughs> You've broken my dream. Last night I dreamt that you were squirrel nutkin. <laughs> and I was a little lady squirrel. And you'd built your house halfway up an oak tree. Uh, was it thatched in dandelion leaves? <laughs> How did you guess? I never use anything else. <laughs> Well, anyway, in my dream, I climbed up the tree and I knocked on your little door. And you pretended you weren't in, so I had to kick it down. <laughs> and there you were, hiding behind your acorn. <laughs> What do you suppose that means? It means I've got to build it a damn sight higher next year. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I do love a man with a sense of humour. I always say if a man can make you laugh, everything else will follow. Mm -hmm. In my case, Mrs Slocum, it may be a very long way behind. <laughs> <laughs> I brought these for you. <laughs> I thought they'd be lovely in front of a little log fire. I haven't got a log fire. Haven't you? Oh, I know where there's a lovely one. <laughs> <laughs> Mrs. Slocum, would you be good enough to return to your own counter? Mr. Humphreys is not here for idle chit chat. He's here to serve customers. In that case, oh, I'll have a size 48 nightshirt. Size 48? That's big enough for two. 
Exactly. <laughs> yes, yes, well, I appreciate that as colleagues of Mrs. Slocum, you have been trying to cover for her. But it's been plain to me for some time that she's not been herself. As witness these letters of complaint from customers calling her a crabby old cow <laughs> and a tetchy old trout <laughs> and a miserable old bat. <laughs> Captain Peacock, in all your experience, have you ever known one of our employees to be described like that? Not by a customer, sir. <laughs> <laughs> Well, uh, the reason for all this becomes clear upon the discovery of these items. Gin and... Uh... <laughs> Gin and... Uh... Gin again. Now, where is she now? Uh, perhaps she's still having lunch, sir. Captain Peacock, she hasn't even been into the canteen. Enter. Uh, we found Mrs. Slocum, sir. She was in the four-hour bar next to her. Oh. I think it temporarily slipped her mind what the time was and where she worked. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Rumble, I hope you're not laboring under the misapprehension that I was in there boozing. <laughs> I only popped in to buy a packet of croissants. <laughs> Mrs. Slocum, without doubting your word for one moment, would you mind blowing into this bag? Certainly, Mr. Rumpole. <laughs> and I must warn you that your whole future at Grace Brothers may depend upon the result. Another hundred yards to go. We passed it, Mr. Grace. Oh, there we are. Uh, uh. I've got a surprise for you. You've been doing it on your own for the last five minutes. Oh, you get used to that sort of thing at my time of life. <laughs> <laughs> Come along, you should be feeling fit and healthy now. Oops. Oh. Oh. oh, come in. There's a bloke outside wants to sell you a medical chair. A medical chair? What's that do? Well, it's electrically operated and it sort of relaxes your limbs. Like, you sit in it, switch on it, and it makes you do this. <laughs> I'd do that anyway. Tell him to go away. Oh, all right. Go away. Mr Grace, mm -hmm. the first floor say if you want them to wait outside any longer, could they have coffee and sandwiches? Oh, tell them to come in. Come in. After you, Miss Brown. Rumbo, get in here immediately and bring that medical report with you. Well, get on with it. Uh, uh, yes, sir. Um, as Mrs. Slocum's behaviour was so at variance with her normal character, we had the case examined by an eminent psychiatrist. And, well, sir, what in effect he says is that Mrs. Slocum appears to have built up a fantasy world for herself. And in this world, she's deluded herself that she's in love with Mr. Humphreys. Now, as Mr. Humphreys has failed to respond, Understandably. Very understandably. <laughs> Mrs. Slocum was taken to the bottle. I didn't need to pay a hundred quid to hear that. What's the cure? Well, sir, the, the, the psychiatrist says that in his experience, when fantasy turns into reality, it often fades away. Ah, in other words, if Mr. Humphreys had a go at her, she'd run a mile. <laughs> yes, sir. 
There's no problem then, is there, Mr. Humphreys? Well, I must confess, Mr. Grace, I would find it very difficult. <laughs> well, just pretend she's that girl that I get so excited about in Dallas. Uh, what's her name? Sue Allen. Oh, oh, my leg's gone. <laughs> <laughs> Thinking about Sue Allen wouldn't necessarily help me. How about J.R.? <laughs> When you think about J.R.? No, it's not him, it's that hat. <laughs> well, sir, the fact remains that if Mr. Humphreys could steal himself to, as it were, make a bold advance, the shock might cure her. As I'm sure none of us wants to lose, Mrs. Slocum. Oh, no, we're all very fond of her. So I'd have to find the right place in the right moment. How about the, in the box at the ballet tonight? You can pretend it's a back row of the pictures and, you know, get in there and whee! <laughs> It'll be better at Covent Garden cos the usherettes there don't have torches, so you can get in there and whee! What ballet are you going to see? The Nutcracker Street. <laughs> Be as good as you can, we've missed the beginning. Oh, I'm very sorry, Captain Peacock, but I had to have another drink. I've got this awful dry feeling at the back of my throat. I think it's the new perfume I'm wearing. When are the nutcrackers coming on? <laughs> That's the big one at the end. <laughs> oh, she is an old. I hadn't noticed her. <laughs> No, I mean that ballet is in the second half of the program. Noblakov. He's very big in Russia. <laughs> He's pretty big here, too. <laughs> Why is he twiddling her around like that, making her dizzy? That's called a pirouette. And that's called an entrechat. What's that? Well, it's French. All the terms in ballet are in French. The entre, as in entre nous, means between. And what's the other bit? Well, uh, C-H-A-T, pronounced cha, means, um... Oh, I know what that means. It's French for pussy. <laughs> you see what he's doing to her. It must mean something else. <laughs> Shh. Be quiet. Have they all forgotten the words? Yeah. They don't have words in ballet, you ignorant book. <laughs> Why is she wagging her finger at him like that? He, she's rejecting his advances. Oh, she'd have to do a damn sight more than that in Catford. <laughs> This is the famous party dur. <laughs> I know what party dur means. Father of twins. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Hum Mr. Humphreys. Mr. Humphreys. I, I don't want to spoil your evening, but we set you next to Mrs. Slocum for a purpose. You have spoiled my evening. <laughs> what do I have to do? Act like the man of her dreams and give her knee the tickle. How do you mean? Like this. 
My mind was wandering. <laughs> no. We'll have to take it a stage further. How do I take it a stage further? Like this. <laughs> I can't do that to Mrs. Slocum. Well, take her hand and do this. Miss Brock! <laughs> Where did you learn to do that? In Catford. Now, get on with it. <laughs> She's dropped out. Surely she hasn't been drinking in the box. No, out of it. Liqueur chocolates. <laughs> <laughs> well, Mr. Alphys, it would seem that for the moment your problems are over. On the contrary, Captain Peacock, they're just beginning. <laughs> 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 